Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zoom Into Wine. It's time for the show and your host, Ian Blackburn. All right, and here we go. The stars of white wine. You know, we put these stars events together um, pretty much once, one a month is gonna be our pace, uh, really to showcase uh, great wine talent um, and uh, talk about great wines and get our audience involved and certainly when we started our zooms it was a response to the pandemic and and uh, this zoom technology made it possible for us to get together like this now that we're unable to now we were able to take off our masks and do things again i intend to maintain the pace here and uh, we're going to continue to do online tastings because i can get you together in santa barbara and santa monica and san diego and uh, we can all still taste wine and and uh, no uh, $40,000 hotel bill, which is why I don't have any hair. So uh, uh, thank you guys for supporting the Zoom efforts. And I hope you guys enjoy the, the effort tonight. We've got some really great, talented people. And we're going to start off with my friend Sandra Gomez on the Zoom, a graduate, by the way, of our Learn About Wine School. And uh, she uh, went on to, she definitely had a plan. She's a very smart lady and she came in looking to learn her way into the wine industry and started uh, importing wines from Portugal. So I welcome Sandra Gomez. How are you tonight? Hi everybody, can you hear me a phone? I, I can, thank you. Great, great. Uh, yeah, I'm one of the fortunate ones who have had Ian as my incredible instructor early on in my um, one education career and after I took a couple of his classes I went to Sonoma State for my wine MBA if you didn't realize that there was an MBA in wine there um, so uh, I always knew I wanted to bring in wine from Portugal which I know it feels like it's kind of like bringing sand to the beach a little bit because it's California, there's incredible wine here. So why are you going to be bringing in wine from Portugal? So first of all, you know, I'm Portuguese, but the region as a whole is undiscovered. You know, there's great value in these wines and they've been producing wines for hundreds of years. Port and Vino Verde are the wines that people know for the most part, but there's other wines from other regions that really deserve uh, a place in the spotlight, which is where I think I come in. So we are a small import and distributor of Portuguese wines into uh, Southern California, and we focus specifically on a new generation of producer and winemaker. And these are people who are in their 30s, 40s, and they have gone out and they've gotten their education, they've gotten their master's in viticulture, They've, they've, they've gone ahead and they've worked several harvests in Bordeaux and Napa and New Zealand. And then they came back home to Portugal and they wanted to invest in their land, in their country, in land that literally had been owned by family members for hundreds of years, but was sitting barren. And they said, you know what? I'm going to plant the, the best varieties in this region and we're going to make the best wine that these regions can make. So today we're going to be talking about the down region and the Pesado. So uh, this winemaker, actually this producer, she's Brazilian, she's kind of like me. Uh, she is from Brazil and after living abroad for some years, she decided to go back home and invest in her grandmother's land and to highlight the main varietals of her region. Um, is to really show the world just how unique and transformative these wines can be. So this picture here is actually of the Porto, and that's the traditional uh, boats that you would see back in the day that they would transport port from the Door Valley down to port. This uh, young lady that you see here in this picture, her name is Juliana Kelman. She is the producer of uh, the wine we're going to be talking today. But as a company, we wanted to highlight again a new generation of winemaker producer people who are focused on sustainability they're really highlighting the uh the authenticity of these regions so when we're talking about these regions today we're talking about the down region and it felt 
D-O-A, and the A has a little squiggly line on it. And uh, if you go to the next slide, we can see uh, kind of like where they're located. It's, it's in the middle of the country. And I think that this, uh, this uh, highlight slowed down with the wines from Portugal, the Antwerp, and Burgundy. So down is the region, it's in part of the country, it's that red little dot that you see, um, and you, you pronounce it like down, up, down. Um, it's about 30 minutes south of Douro, and it's surrounded by three mountain ranges that protect it from the harsh winters and the harsh cold from the north and the harsh heat from the south. So it's like in its own little bubble. And uh, even though it's central to the country, it still remains sort of like a, a Mediterranean climate to a continental climate. So it's a cool region, it's high elevation. Uh, it is, uh, again, one of the oldest and most traditional wine producers of Portugal. Uh, and uh, wines coming from this region, they tend to be more elegant style. When I put these wines in front of people, so the white is your Burgundian white, it's very elegant, it's very sophisticated. And when you're talking about the minerality and, uh, you know, the mineralized characters of these wines, that's basically what you get. And it's all about the composition of that region. High elevation, granite bedrock, cold climates, uh, cold uh, winters rather, and dry summers. And it, it, it allows for a lighter wine that still has some great body great complexity, but it's very sophisticated in those uh, we are talking about the family itself, some of family vineyards, which is woman owned and operated, again, Juliet and Um, They went to the region in 2000, they bought a few plots of land that had already been planted with Tariga Nacional and other native varietals for about these vineyards, these vines are maybe 40 to 80 years old, but they decided they were going to plant more vines of native varieties. Um, this is also uh, the kind of operation where it's, it's pretty hands off. It's dry farming, no irrigation, very low intervention. And, and when you hear those words, you think natural, or you think, uh, you know, organic wines. But in reality, the wines coming from Portugal, they're all sustainably stored. So they don't have to be stamped with a certified organic or certified vegan or certified sustainable in order for them to be really beautiful and clean and clean. Um, so, so Juliana went back home and she said, I'm going to make the best possible wine for this baby to be And that's her mission, to produce high quality wine with native varietals to highlight what's going on in this region. So this varietal specifically is in the battle. And in Cruzado is, is the queen of this region, is in the white. Um, and uh, you do find it in other regions, but particularly here. If you like a, uh, again, white burgundy or a, uh, a Vermentino, this is a good, um, a good replacement at a, at a value, right? Because the wines coming from Portugal are high quality out of great price. And it's all about sustainability. As you can see, it's very hands-on. They pick the grapes by hand, they put them into small boxes, and they walk them the 50 yards to the winery to get processed. And this is a family operation, and they, they hire within within the villages. So, you know, this one is one of our vegan uh, offerings, and when people think of wine, they don't really think that wine couldn't be anything but vegan because the plants are fruit. But if you see on the photo on the right, um, you have two wines. One is a little more cloudy, one is a little clearer. And when you when you press the grapes and you get the fruit, you get this cloudy wine. But then it's in the filtration and the clarification process that you get this crystal clear wine. And it's in that process where the vegan sort of happens. So when you get uh, proteins, whether animal derived or vegetable derived, they bind to sediments and then sediments sort of fall to the bottom so you clear them away, you get this beautiful clear wine. So that's where the vegan acid comes from. Um, this one is also uh, aged in, uh, in barrels and in uh, in the stainless steel tanks. And this is the kind of wine that you can drink now or there's longevity to it. So in the tasting notes, if you have the wine in front of you, uh, they're very clean, fresh aromas, white fruit, a little citrus. Um, 
And uh, again, it's, there's just a minerality in the elegance of the wine. And Portuguese wines, in particular, those wines are very gastronomic. As Portuguese, we love food, so we build wine for food. So whether you have an American, you have lobster with your drawn water, which is the, the, the uh, example here, or you have Asian influence or other influences in other cuisines, these wines are meant to be had with really any food that you put in front of them. And this is definitely our favorite because it's just so beautiful and light and elegant. So you can pair it with anything. Uh, it's just a completely stand up. So, uh, again, that's Juliana. She is our producer and uh, she's just amazing. And just like her, we are two girls who are abroad trying to come home and really show the world the beautiful ones from Portugal. So, hopefully, you guys enjoyed it. And thank you so much for having me today. If you have any questions, let me know. Have a Happy Great day. job, Sandra. Great job. Um, this wine just is so pure and so daft and fun and uh, affordable. Um, the yeah. Portuguese, uh, you know, dollar or euro versus the dollar ratio is just really in a good spot. Do you know if they still have that po program in Portugal too, where if you buy a house in Portugal, you get like EU residency and uh, is it something Basically, like Basically, if you invest something like half a million dollars, they call it what they call um, a golden visa you get European citizenship. Um, and actually we're seeing a lot of folks from Asian countries coming to Europe on that program. So you're seeing some Chinese, Japanese, Koreans coming into Portugal, buying properties, whether they're vineyards or they're building and they're getting their golden citizens that way. So yes, it's very much alive and it's just a beautiful country to visit. So when you guys are able to get on a plane, I certainly encourage you to go to, go to Portugal. Enjoy the food and the wine. Why, thank you so much, Sandra. Great way to start. Thank you. I hope Obrigado, everyone. <laughs> and uh, how do we say t uh, cheers to everybody in um, in Portuguese? Salude. Salude. Salude, everyone. Salude. Cheers. I really do enjoy it. This wine goes down really nice, easy, fun, and... Uh, I, I just think it's a great value and uh, they're, they're, you know it's easy to find uh, expensive wines uh, to love but uh, when you can find something that has a lot of value you can drink it every day it can be a house white for you um, it sells tonight uh, by the way everybody on this zoom tonight gets special pricing for the next 24 hours on all the wines in tonight's zoom uh, the prices that you see in the brochure are actually higher than uh, what they are on the website for the next 24 hours. And there's an additional 10% off when you assort 12 bottles. So uh, take advantage of that if you can tonight. Uh, we have these wines in stock and they all, all ship to you on Tuesday um, if, uh, if that works out for you. So I thank you very much for your time, Sandra. And uh, we move on into wine number two. And we're going to Chablis. You know, we we had some great wines uh, in the lineup, and uh, I love them for all for different reasons. But um, I think if anybody were to ask me one of my favorite white wines from white wine regions to to have in my cellar, it's Chablis. I I love aging Chablis. I like to uh, I love focus the focus of this of of this place this this soil this Camarigian soil the way it expresses itself in the wine. It's pure Chardonnay. And we have a special guest here tonight to help us with this, My, uh, Mark Yeager. You're, the, you're out there? Hi, right, buddy. Thank you so much. Let me uh, highlight you. And uh, thanks for making time for us, buddy. Absolutely. Happy to be here. And uh, you are the importer of the wine? Yeah, so um, I work for Juliana Imports. I'm the general manager of the company and uh, um, uh, Adrian Gotharin and I um, actually this is a, a very this is a brand new wine to my portfolio um, and a brand new wine to the uh, grapevine portfolio uh, with Keith Fox he was, who you all uh, seem to know or have met before and um, I'm, I'm super excited to share about it so you know it, this is a, a very classic uh, whatever that means um, uh, COVID story uh, where 
it's Adrian or my my owner and I, uh, Steve Lewis, who's been in you know running run this Julian Imports for about 26 years, has been 100 percent like Italian and Spanish wine in in, uh, in focus influenced. He told me uh, I don't know six seven months ago and was like I need more Chablis, I, need, I need more Chardonnay in my life and I said I got a guy for you and um, Adrian and I met via some mutual friends in uh, in, uh, uh, in Aspen and uh, just connected on Facebook and just hit off this great relationship we're both about the same age 34 35 and um, you know we started talking and I said hey you know we we'd love to uh, love to take care of you in our markets uh, in California and most of the Western US. And he said, I think that'd be great. I know I'd be the only French producer in your portfolio. Um, and uh, I, you know, we taste the wines and as soon as we saw the labels, taste the wines, we fell in love with this producer and it, for, for the wines themselves, but really also because of Adrian and his family and, and kind of who they are, you know, we're, Again, we're in France. We're 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 just just south of Paris, and you're in Burgundy, but it's just this this microcosm of Burgundy that's so different from everywhere else that we typically think of from Chardonnay and, and Pinot Noir in the region. Um, you know, one of the one of the big things that this producer has, and only four other producers have in all of Chablis, is they actually have some holdings within the Grand Weep. Uh, clean mop of the Grand Cru, um, and that that is just really we get very little of it. We get about a hundred bottles a year, um, but it's 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 a it's a pretty amazing thing. And um, you know this this wine we have, or you know here here you have the younger guy, of course, is uh, Adrian Guthrman, uh, his father Elaine uh, next to him. Um, you know they've been the family has been around since the late 1500s, as you can see, 1585. They've had Holdings within within the region, they've they've lived in that in, in the in the village of Chablis um, since then. But they didn't. They were you know as many people were back in the day. They were they were very much just the grape growers. They sold you know to other nego they sold to negociants, other domains, and um, uh, they never really made their wine. It wasn't until the late 1950s when Raoul Gautrin was like you know we should start making our wine, which is uh, Adrian's grandfather. And, um, you know, in, in 1957, there was that insane frost, uh, which we'll talk more about because they just had another really insane frost in 2021 um, that decimated the vineyards in Chablis. And it was right around then that Raul, as they were replanting everything and uh, he, he had the foresight, the vision to say, you know, what, we have these beautiful land or these, these holdings in, in Grenouille, Vaudezir, Les Clos, Vaillant, um, and of course can make regular uh, Chablis AOC, Petit Chablis, and uh, we should start making our own wine. Um, and so that was kind of really how the domain started in itself. Um, and, you know, here you're, these are two pictures from with, within the Grand Cru, um, from Lake Close specifically. And, you know, you can see right down to the village of Chablis. It's, uh, they have some of the best holdings. There's that beautiful, uh, you know, topsoil with chalk and limestone underneath that gives the unbelievable, beautiful acidity and brightness to the wines uh, that we all know and love really from the region. So one thing, again, another, another great shot. Um, and you can, you know, you can, you can see that, that, that chalk and that limestone in the vineyard. Um, you know, one thing that really struck me when I started talking to Adrian is uh, when we started talking about his winemaking techniques and, and, and the style of winemaking, you know, you look at the, the label and I, I, you know, you can maybe, uh, if some of you can see it in there, um, it's, uh, it's very, very classic. It's very, it's very much, um, it, it kind of reminds me of Paul Pernod a little bit in the style of the label. Um, and I, for whatever reason, I expected the wines to be extremely rich. Um, and when you taste them, they're almost, you know, not, not there, they have a beautiful, you know, richness and, and styles of the wine, but they're very linear, especially the Chablis AOC. Um, and what I also love about his wines, he doesn't make every single one of his crews the same. Um, you know, here's a beautiful shot of, of, of the grapes and, and, and really, you know, when I, when I first asked Adrian, you know, what inspires you to, uh, to make wine and what is your philosophy and you know his immediate response is if you don't have great grapes you can't make great wine 
Um, and he's like, I learned that from the very beginning. He's like, I've been walking the vineyard since I was, you know, since I was able to walk, but I, you know, didn't really uh, get involved too much, um, of course, until the end of high school. And then he went to college and, and, and learned in Bone um, and then went back to Chablis and he worked with a few other other producers, but is really focused on uh, on the family and everything. Um, and so again, you know, between his Chablis and his Vaillant, they make a Ville Vine, a, a beautiful old vine. Uh, this wine, the, the regular Chablis that we're having tonight is comes from 9.7 hectares. So not huge production by any stretch. Um, there's no way this wine could be distributed in every state in the US, there's not nearly enough made. Um, and, you know, we're talking a few thousand cases at, at max. Um, and there is, uh, he does use a little bit of only old barrel in this wine. Um, and, and you can you can not really taste that the only reason to use the, uh, the old barrel is again to get a little bit of oxygen, a little bit of a little bit of that nuttiness to come through. Uh, you know, one of the things as uh, as a sommelier that I, you know when I was studying, and Ian, I'm sure you you, you teach every once in a while, and, and we we kind of use some of these buzzwords and keywords within regions to get people to understand, and it's very much a blanketed statement, um, and isn't always you know, but but when you dive deep into certain producers, they sometimes go off the rails a little bit. Uh, one of those things is, and when we talk about Chablis, we always talk about Batonage. You talk about stirring the lees and very extended lees aging. Um, and uh, one thing that I, I love about this wine and, and the crispness of it really comes from the fact that Adrian and his family do not do any batonnage. They do extended leaves aging. This wine sits on the leaves for 12 to 15 months minimum prior to release. Um, and uh, But they don't stir the leaves. They really don't want to add extra oxygen when they don't need to because they believe in a very, very linear, just absolutely stunning style um, of Chablis. And you know he also really works on where these um, the, the these parcels are and the ripeness that they're able to get out of them. So if he's working with a parcel where, where these come from, he he doesn't use any um, uh, he doesn't use any you know any new oak whatsoever because the ripeness of the grapes are already there. Um, but where he has you know some of his Vaillant, uh, his, his premier crew and certain of his grand crews are younger vines, a little bit younger grapes. He will add just a touch of oak to some of those wines to give it a little bit more roundness because the the, the, the ripeness of the grapes doesn't get there naturally. But his Vaudezir is Grenouille, um, you know, absolutely fantastic. And 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 again, no oak, no, no badinage except for that, you know, second, third use barrel that you can't really taste it. He, again, everything start and ends, starts and ends in the vineyard with this family. Uh, they still do use the horse uh, every once in a while to, to, to plow the vineyards, especially in the really, really old parcels where they're, you know, very, 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 very close together and it's hard to get some of the tractors through there. Um, and so, you know, there's, uh, th this is, this isn't just a marketing piece right here. They actually do use the horse um, um, to plow the vineyards. And again, I just think that goes to show you the, the quality and the attention they give to, to all their wines. So. Um, again, really excited to be here. Uh, one thing I do want to know, I know we talked a little bit, you know, 2021 was crazy in Chablis. Uh, they lost between 50 to 70% of the fruit during the frost in the, in the spring this year. Um, super sad, but you know, they, they're able to kind of get through it. 2018, which you drink today, very, very lush vintage, a lot of fruit, decent amount of wine made. Uh, 2019 kind of short, 2020 is going to be a, a pretty normal vintage. And then we'll see just a little bit of 21 for most of the producers out there. And then hopefully 2022, we'll have a, a, a beautiful vintage again. But again, Ian, thank you very much for having me. And uh, it's been been great to introduce the brand and, and the people uh, behind it. Well, I hope if, if you guys have this one in the glass, you just take a minute and try to smell that, that ocean breeze and that uh, super crisp green apple and asian pear type of characteristic that is chardonnay um and just it's through the magnifying glass of uh, very good vineyards you could tell that there's a weight and a concentration in this wine that kind of separates it from other chablis as well um i taste i taste a lot of the bigger brands um and they're all beautiful wines but this one just has a little extra muscle to it and i really believe that's probably from the you know, quality of the vineyards, the fact that they only have nine hectares or approximately 20 acres of land, 
um, you know, they, they don't have a lot of uh, um, fluff. So it's, it's really, uh, uh, you know, no filling, just really good stuff going into the bottle. So uh, it's pronounced and I, I, I put it up against any Chablis in its category. I think uh, 2018 is helping us all tonight too because it is a generous vintage and able to be enjoyed. But this wine will age like beautifully. Uh, I'd love to have five years in bottle with this wine um, and really show off an, another gear. But uh, that's what's great about Chablis. You can enjoy its youthful vibrancy or watch it add a little weight and complexity with five years in the bottle. Mark, uh, so I, I just want to thank you very much for, for being here, Mark, and My pleasure. Uh, talking about it because we love that personal interaction. And if you're able to stick on board with us, we're gonna uh, we're gonna talk to a legend now, uh, Dick Doré and his wife Jenny. Uh, they're with us on the Zoom, and uh, it's always great to to be able to to say that. And thank you, Mark. Thank you, uh, Jenny and Dick. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. How are you? Uh, we're we're very well, thank you. But you're gonna have to stop calling Dick a legend. It's really going to his head. I, I actually I created a He's whole. So a whole event around him one time so we could we could I always have that name for him come on <laughs> <laughs> well i appreciate it I'll he's, tell you. he's a legend in his own mind that's it so anyway it's great to be back in uh, after what a two-day respite from our chardonnay to uh yeah talk we, about another one of our whites we showed off uh, Dick's wine um, with our trade audience on Wednesday, and uh, and so we 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 have a number of Shenans on in this in this uh, round of stars of white wine, but uh, also you know I did the final selection. I am a little partial to Shenan, and in California, um, I really think you guys are the benchmark producer, and uh, there's a, a number of other very good ones but you guys have been doing this for how long how long have you been making Chenin Blanc and how long have you been making it from this vineyard from the beginning um well you know this is a special vineyard it was planted uh, back in 1966 by my great uncle Ernesto Wickenden and uh, you know back then a lot of the original plantings in the Santa Maria Valley were Chenin Blanc, Chenin Blanc and Cabernet. They no longer exist and now it's Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. But he went and took some cuttings and on um, this little three and a half acre parcel that he had that, would, that uh, was located between the uh, Cambria Winery and the Mondavi uh, Winery at that time. Uh, in fact, the first uh, but from 1968 till the time we took it over in 85, this fruit went into Kendall Jackson Chardonnay. <laughs> they didn't know what they didn't know. They didn't know what to do with it. Right, right. I mean, that's... Any, anyway, it's it's an interesting story. But you know, Billy and I started the winery 35 years ago. We've been making a shin for 35 years. <clears throat> when he was up at Shalom uh, with Dick Graff. They always made a dry barrel fermented Chenin Blanc. Uh, we've changed that a little bit in that uh, we barrel ferment half of it in, in the pungence, and then we stainless ferment the other half, and then we turn around and put it in a neutral oak for about uh, for about eight months sur leaves. So it makes for a little more complexity. It makes for a little more, I think, an old world in style and. Uh, Anyway, it's uh, it's become one of our uh, uh, basic wines in the market. And uh, I, when we started making it uh, in '85, people said you're crazy. You know, people are thinking of uh, a gallon jug of sweet wine or something. But now uh, it's probably one of our most popular wines. So anyway, it's certainly it's certainly a signature wine for us because, and now we're we're happy to see more young producers making, uh, growing and making Chenin Blanc um, in the classic style. And we're, we're delighted to have some company. Yeah, and it's, yeah, we, it still we, represents a great value for for Santa Barbara too, because the, the, the wineries of Santa Barbara, have, like all great regions, have increased in price and 
you can still get a bottle of Chenin Blanc at a very fair rate. So it's yeah. a it's a great value proposition. It drinks like a champion. I, I do have a little bit of a slideshow I should be showing. So I just want to catch us up in there and uh, make sure I got everything. A little shot of the of the ranch there. Is that where you guys? Yeah, are that's going? our winery, our new winery. Oh, yeah, no. that's um, that. That was the first we completed the new facility in um, in two thousand and nine. It was the Santa Barbara County's first all solar uh, winery, which we're very proud of. And uh, that's me and uh, <laughs> Billy, uh, my partner for uh, thirty five years, and uh, I've known the guy for almost fifty. So uh, he, you know, was. Uh, a pioneer in the Santa Maria Valley, planting the grapes with uh, another legend, a guy by the name of Dale Hampton, who was the one that just really brought the wine industry to Santa Barbara County. But anyway, Bill goes back all the way to the beginning, as well as working with uh, Dick Graff up at Shalom yeah. for about five years. We're, we're very lucky because as, <clears throat> with his viticultural background, uh, we look at uh, every project as, as farmers, whether we grow it outright ourselves, own the land or purchase uh, the fruit. Billy has to control the farming. Um, and he's still the go-to guy in Santa Barbara County, viticulturally speaking. So it's been a, it's been a great match. Now our wines just tend to be very terroir driven. And that's our, our aim with wine. Yeah. And as you can see in that photo, we make a lot of wine, and that's only part of it. We, we make about 28 different wines, but we don't make much of any one. I mean, we make a lot of, uh, a lot of different wines because we like flavors, but... Uh, um, well, and this, and the Shannon, uh, the Ernesto Wickedon uh, Vineyard is just slightly more than three acres. Um, so we're limited in some years. Um, <clears throat> Uh, there's less than others, um, so we, we really do live and die by, by the vintage since it's uh, a part of our estate. Um, and it's a really special little spot, as Dick was saying, it's, it's on the Santa Maria bench between what's now the Byron and Cambria vineyard, which a lot of that um, mesa there is, is very windblown and very cool. Uh, but the Ernesto Wickedon Vineyard it sits in a little amphitheater, um, wind protected, so it gets a little bit warmer uh, than the surrounding uh, Chardonnay vineyards. And, yeah, and the soil, of course, as you would expect, the big at the bottom of the Tepsky Canyon, very alluvial, <clears throat> heavy gravel, so very stressed vines. And <clears throat> the vines look like. Uh, like tree trunks, uh, basically, and the cordons are, are are bigger than my arms. Uh, you know, it probably would there give. It it, there, there's a good example, but uh, it, it just is. It's a, a sort of a a landmark wine for our, our vineyard for Santa Barbara yeah. County. And I we've always it, and we've always made it in this style, so it's dry. Um, as Dick was saying, it's got no no new oak. Um, and we really do discourage uh, secondary fermentation as best we can, um, keeping our barrel room uh, colder than uh, for the whites than we do for the for the reds. That's our taste room. And and of course, um, with the COVID regulations, we're not doing any indoor tastings yet. Um, it's all outside, which is really nice. You have a beautiful view of the of Fox and Canyon. They give you dates for when that can change, or is that? Uh... Um, we're um, we're hoping that we can get the historic uh, tasting shack and start doing a limited amount of indoor tasting some point this summer. All right. Well, I want to thank you for joining our session tonight. I'm sorry I didn't get the wines to you so you could taste along with us. But uh... Uh, I need to I need to order the the the, uh, the pack because yeah. I'm, I'm, I've been uh, been salivating good. with the descriptions of the wine. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's been very interesting. And thank you for including us, Ian. You know, we, we are pretty much known for our reds and our Pinot Noir and to give a chance to for to us to uh, sort of showcase our, our whites has been amazing. And I thank you. My pleasure. I've worked for many restaurants and um, 
in the Shannon category, your wine has almost always been represented in every single one of them. So um, I, I really thank you for being here tonight and, and showing this off. When I saw your name on our screen, I was so excited that, that we were get to get to do this with you both. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you for inviting us. We really Thanks, appreciate yeah. it. Real pleasure. Well, um, it's a great, uh, great Santa Barbara story, and uh, there are great people. And if you get one, a wonderful place to go and visit, the Taste Your Room experience at Foxton is always one of the top uh, to visit. You guys still operate the old winery too, or is it just the new winery? Yeah, they, well, with COVID, um, the historic tasting shack where we feature our Bordeaux wines um, has been closed. Uh, it was just the logistics, uh, but again, we, we hope to open uh, the shack and for limited amount of, of tasting inside by, by the summer. And we're open by reservations, which is the protocol now, which is, it's, work, it's working and we'll continue to do that. I love the, um, the kiss of the kind of that lanolin character that you get in the yeah. Shannon. And just that yeah. little bit of that, that the palate weight, that oiliness. Uh, you mm -hmm. said you're using older older wood barrels. Um, yeah. And uh, about half of it, right? And, about uh, at half, and then but after uh, primary fermentation, then we put it to the neutral uh, oak barrels where it ages then surleys. But Billy, Billy does the same thing with the juice to extend the fermentation, and it's usually goes for 30 days with natural yeast. It's pretty, pretty amazing. All natural, yeah. huh? Well, uh, beautiful wines tasting great tonight. Perfect spot in the lineup. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. So I think uh, uh, we've had a couple of, of great Shannons. We've got one more in the lineup tonight. Uh, yeah, so. well, and, and I would like to tell people if they do get some of the, our Shannon or another, Shannon ages beautifully. Uh, we, we really enjoy Shannon's 15 and even 20 years old. Well, yes, uh, and I, I think you have some of those too, if I remember talking to you about that. Uh, you can yeah. go back and taste uh, old wines almost every day now, right? Yeah, we do. We, we bring them out for dinners um, occasionally, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we'll continue the love for all things Foxen. And thanks for uh, t talking to us about the Shannon. And we're now going to uh, get in our jet plane and fly over to Europe and head to Alsace. So uh, we're gonna taste another phenomenal Alsatian wine. And uh, our guest for our domain Zind Kubrick is uh, Rachel. Um, how are you, Rachel? I'm great, how are you, Ian? Uh, great to have you. Um, Thank you for having me. Uh, this is one of my favorite little wines to tell people about because it's a it's a particularly unusual wine in a couple of ways. And so if everybody can get that in the glass, I know I need to pour mine. And <clears throat> did uh, everybody get their jars okay? Every, everybody's little jar experience workout. The wine that we're having tonight is called Zind, and it is a special wine because it is not very common in Alsace. Um, it is made from a grape variety. Uh, well, it's made from a little bit of Chardonnay and a little bit of a grape variety called Exarwa. Yes. Tell us all about this wine, Rachel. So this is about two thirds Chardonnay and then one third Oshawa. It's very untraditional because uh, Chardonnay is not an authorized grape in Alsace. Uh, the, the noble varietals, as you know, there are four noble varietals and Chardonnay is not one of them. But when Olivier Umbrecht, uh, he passed his MW in 1989, so he's the first French master of wine, um, he started planting Chardonnay that year in the Cool Winds Bowl Vineyard, which is where this Chardonnay comes from for the Zind. A really interesting idea. He um, will tell us about this wine in a second because we got to t taste with him on Tuesday and I recorded the tasting. So we'll we'll do that in a second, but I'll just front front load the information a little bit. 
uh, and take you through a couple of slides if I can. There we go. Um, and what I'll play this while we're 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 going to talk over it and just have this in the background because there's some really uh, interesting Alsatian Oompa Loompa music going on in the yeah, background. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is Olivier Umbrecht and his father. Uh, so they have uh, 13 generations of family winemaking. Uh, Olivier is the 12th generation and then his son is the 13th generation. Alsace is about 75 miles long as you can see on the first map we showed and then about five miles wide. It's not very big. Uh, and then uh, Olivier has certified the vineyard organic and biodynamic. So these are all um, fermented naturally in the cellar. Uh, he uses old, uh, very big old Alsatian barrels to ferment the wines in and it just, uh, the outcome is really incredible. The single vineyards that are on the slide here, Chloe Winsville in particular, is where this uh, Zind, Zind is coming from. And it's a single vineyard monopole. And as you can see here, a lot of the vines are very high altitude. There's very diverse soil types. And um, it's one of the most complex regions in France. Uh, coupled with the climate, uh, the Chloe Winsbold vineyard is one of the last vineyards to be harvested, but limestone, clay, chalky rocks, so all of that beautiful minerality you're getting in the glass right now is just coming from the vineyard. Olivier really uh, likes to, for the wines to shine on their own, for the terroir to be expressed on their own, so they tend to be very elegant, very mineral packed um, and you could just really smell and taste that limestone character lots of citrus fruit and for me when i drink this wine i just my palate salivates there's all this zesty acidity um, but it's delicate and very well balanced yeah hopefully you guys have it in the glass now and the first thing you're gonna smell is just this like wow what is that it's got kind of a merceau like uh, absolutely welcome and um it's just really tremendous uh and it's it's from it's it's basically alsace it is this is what alsace is about it's that stone it's that hillside it's that landlocked little place that has this incredible history they speak german they speak french they they have uh, amazing cuisine uh chefs like jean georges are from Alsace. There's all kinds of uh, culinary treasures from Alsace that you know are were basically made out of necessity and out of uh, the fact that some of these things are what they needed to do. You know, uh, preserving meats and uh, doing uh, incredible things with fruits and, and 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 preserves and all kinds of pastries and things that they could make when the, that land is covered in snow. And this guy is also the first French master of wine. Uh, he is a big man. He's about 6'5", six 6'4", six something like that. And his hands are huge. Rachel, have you ever shook his hand? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, and, you know, really, Olivier, despite being, you know, almost seven feet tall, I know his son is seven feet tall, um, There, he's just almost like a, a really nice teddy bear. He's sure. so... He's so kind, he's so knowledgeable, um, and just what he imparts in the wines are really incredible. So what, he, what he's done for Alsatian wines and Domaine Zinnenbrecht is really incredible. There's a photo of his father and these ancient wood casks. Many of them are over 100 years old. And yeah, my point about it, he, I, when I shook his hand the last time I, I got to see him, uh, my, my hand just like disappeared into his palm. I was like, oh my God, his hand is so big. And uh, he is definitely a giant. And it, I, I think our video today has um, uh, a little uh, spot, a shot of his, his son. I, I, I think it's in there. Let's see if we got it in there. Oh, I got to advance here and I'll turn on the, the sound. Good morning to you. And we're now going to talk about the 2016 uh, Zind, which will be used on Saturday night 
and oh, a fantastic chainsaw came on right outside of my window. So I mute myself most of this time, but I, I apologize for the sound. Uh, it's uh, featured on our website, the 2000, 2016 Zind. All right, so let's talk about this uh, 2016 Zind Humbrush Z016. Now, if uh, those of you at home can notice, that is not a two on the date, it is a Z. And that's because this is a fairly non-traditional blend, right? That's not a part of the uh, Appalachian Origin Control? Yes, it's a uh, Val de France, or what we used to call Val de Tarde in the past in France. And in, it comes from a, one of our very good vineyard called Clovis Bull in uh, Hunavir, uh, where we, you know, uh, sell, uh, produce, Riesling, Pinot Gris, and Gewurz. And uh, when we purchased this clove back in 1987, um, some of the vines planted there, we had to pull them out because they didn't correspond to our uh, requirements of uh, quality clones and uh, uh, rootstocks and, and things like that. So the part nearest to the forest, um, we didn't really know what to plant with. And our idea was to make a classic Pinot d'Alsace blend, mixing Box of War and Pinot Blanc. And uh, when we were in the vineyard, my father had a very good friend of his who came from Burgundy, and they were talking about vineyard and dirt and soil and all that, you know, like two growers would, would share, things like that. And uh, looking at this um, uh, old limestone called Muschelkalk, you know, the very yellow breaks into very flat stones, easy to make walls with. Um, he, he said, oh, in my village in Burgundy, um, I would plant chardonnay in the soil like that. So my father looked at me and said, that's a damn good uh, uh, idea. And let's replace a Pinot Blanc, which is complicated to get good quality material with Chardonnay, where we have more access to better kind of plants. So we planted the 1.3 hectare of Chardonnay and 0.7 hectare of Auxerrois, started to make the blend and all that, not thinking, you know, where we allowed to do it or not. And a few years later, customers came to us and said, you're not allowed to do this, Mr. Humbrecht. So you pull out the vine, you make sparkling wine, because that we're allowed to do it, or you declassify the wine to Van de Tavern, which we did. And the first vintage that we officially released as Vint was the 2001 vintage. And we have been carrying on to do it like that since then. So it's two thirds Chardonnay, one third of Savoie, made the Aldas way, not like in Burgundy. We don't use small barrels. We use, like the other wines, larger casks. It's a vineyard that gives a very elegant, racy, high acid, uh, you know, uh, quite a, a, a almost strict, austere type when it's young. And if you give him a few uh, years of age, like the 16, should really now start to open up. You get that combination of white fruit, minerals coming out, very elegant palate, never very high alcohol, dry and uh, great acidity. Yeah, it's a very nice wine. It is showing so amazingly well. It's got this beautiful minerality on the top. And, and you said that's limestone, not granite? No, no, it's limestone. Um, your limestone, there is a, a lot of different types, uh, depending on its age and moment of formation, fire, or deep in uh, the sea or close to the, to the, the, sea, to the, the continent. And this one goes back about 200 million years old. It's a uh, it's, it's a dolomitic type of limestone, so full of seashells and all that. It really is very, very close to the Bajosian uh, that you find a lot in Burgundy, for example, and it's part of the Trias uh, period. So very poor, very rocky, not very rich. And but the vineyard, the vineyard is quite high up in altitude, very close to the forest. And um, uh, hence the delicacy of the wine. It's not, it's not the kind of uh, wine that will ever have, you know, a lot of sugar or too much alcohol or something like that. Yeah. Oh, beautiful, beautiful wine. And uh, I've seen this in many different incarnations, and it, it it's very consistent and um, and very and ages like, a, you know, like a like a giant. It's just nice, slow evolution um when what do you think the uh the time horizon is for this 2016 is this a 10-year wine a 20-year wine what do you think well i would say you know um it's uh, uh i 
I can only go back to how, since we started to produce it to 2001, and, and any vintages we've made is still uh, showing very, very well today. Yeah. But um, I don't want to frighten people, you know. Uh, but I would say that a really, really nice optimum would be, you know, between 5 and 10, 6 and 12 euros, something like that. So the, the 2016, now being five year old, is really entering that phase where it's enjoyment time at the moment, you know. And um, I would keep it safely another five or six years. But if you want to have fun and lose a bottle in, into the, you know, into your cellar and find it in 10 or 15 years time, I don't think it would be uh, a, a major problem, you know. Uh, it's, it's if, so if you don't mind, I'll show you the vineyard if you allow me to share again. Sure, sure. So it's, it's really um, uh, a beautiful place. That's the Clovinsville. That's a famous church of Unavir. Uh, and the whole claw is this little hillside there, and the Chardonnay is the one closest to the forest uh, on the left side of the vineyard. Great. Well, a, a, a great find. Um, I wanted to thank you for explaining it to us, and uh, I can't uh, recommend the wines of Alsace enough for your cellar, for the value proposition, for the great cuisine, um, they're year round and there's multiple different styles and, and varieties that uh, just kind of accent things a little bit differently. But uh, this Zind wine is a treasure and we love it. So thank you very much for telling us all about it. You're welcome. Lauren, what do you think of that, buddy? Well, you should ask. I just posted. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, is anyone else getting any Petro in this one? Oh, sure. Yeah, get get a little bit of that. It's not the yeah. soil. Is it the, it's the soil. It's not coming from the Chardonnay. No, right? no. It's... it's the soil. It's the region. It's just oh. the character of Alsace. Yeah, yeah wow. very good observation. That's amazing. And it's so uh, complex. You know, you can spit out anything, you know, you get a little... I get a little pineapple, I get a little, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, what's that uh, fruit, uh, uh, mango, like a mango fruit. I get this, uh, I mean, it's tropical. It's just not something you maybe expect, but it also has that Chardonnay kind of character and it's rich and round like a good Chardonnay. But it, that acidity is just so interesting and, and uh, so I just really think this is a, 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 a must um, uh, check out type of wine. And uh, again, the price point that we're able to offer you is only for tonight, um, but it is a great price value under $30 a bottle. Um, and I will promise you that all station wines, almost all of them are leaving that you know low 20 price point. They're all going 30 and north and they are so undervalued at that price point now compared to their peers. I mean, you, you're gonna drink a Bourgogne, a uh, simple Bourgogne for $35. Um, these wines are so much harder to make and these just crazy hillsides with these low yields and they age like beasts. Uh, so uh, I would engage your Alsatian curiosity and get up there and go travel there because you will love it even more. The food, the people, the ambiance. I mean, there's there's definitely a lot of history there to absorb. So uh, thank you, Rachel. Wonderful. Thank you, Ian. It was great to have that wine. Yum, yum. All right. We are now on wine number five. Moving through the wines pretty quickly. Uh, we've got uh, John Silcox uh, joining us via video. But this is a wine that uh, Keith gets me. Hi, Keith. How are you? Beautiful, yeah. Really good, thank you. My pleasure. Um, it's great to uh, to have you guys support me on this. I, I really thank you for for doing this, and uh, we're able to you know go all over the world and taste these amazing wines. Now we're going from Alsace to Rioja. Um, this is a Legre Valagon. And and I uh, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, 
I, I was introduced by you to this to the red wine from this estate and um, uh, I you know there are a number of wonderful Rioja Blancos but this one's really really special and uh, this is a teeny producer we're about to have so I'm gonna play um, uh, I shall cl click through yeah yes yeah, sir most people think of you know, when they think of the Rioja, they think of red wines, and very few people know the the, the, the main grape there is Viura, of course, and they make about 350 cases of this wine. So it's a tiny, tiny production, but I'd Ooh. say Rioja Blancos are some of my all, very favorites. Absolutely, outstanding. Yeah, me too. Um, let me get my next slide up, slide up for us, and then I'll bring us in on this as well. And you know, Vieira, which is what is interesting about that is it's also known as Macabeo, um, which is the grape that they make uh, most cava out of. So it is a pretty interesting grape. Um, and I'm having a hard time with my PowerPoint, so I'm just going to confess to that for a second and reopen it. Give me a moment. And there it is. Now I can bring us in. All right, so this is a look at the bottle, which is uh, all immediately um, a striking presentation. Um, this uh, wine um, has a little bit of color, and uh, on, on first inspection, I asked about wood, but it's not wood, it's skin contact. So it's Viera with some skin contact, and it comes from the area of Rioja, uh, much like Bordeaux, Bordeaux is 97% red wine and 3% white. Uh, Rioja is something close to that, mostly a red wine region, but the white wines that they make age beautifully and have so much character. And here's our couple that makes the wine. And I'm gonna play a video because I, I feel like I, I actually show these slides again in the video. So let me get right into the video with John. He works uh, for the winery and uh, let's, let's Play the video with John. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zoom Into Wine. This is uh, one of my all-time favorite white wines because a lot of people haven't uh, explored it before. It's so different. It's made with different grapes and a different mentality. And I think I have, uh, we have one of the great examples here. This is a really beautiful brand and there's a lot to learn about this category. Um, John, how do we pronounce the brand? Allegre Valgagnon. Cool. I'm going to go into our PowerPoint and we're going to learn about Allegre Valgagnon and a Rioja Blanc, which is made from Macabeo, right? Uh, which is yeah, also known as Viera. So in Rioja, Macabeo is known as Viera, um, and that's the main grape in the blend. It's about 90%, and the other 10% is Garnacha Blanca. And um, there's obviously some golden color here, so we're looking at a little bit of oxidation, oxidative winemaking. It actually, um, the color comes from skin maceration. Um, so this bottle of wine um, is actually made in a very, it's kind of the antithesis of what you think of when you think of Rioja Blanco. Um, typically, kind of the, the region moves more towards the oxidative style, so kind of more that nutty, kind of almost like sherry notes to it. Mm -hmm. um, this is more a fresher style of wine, so it's more about brightness, vibrancy. Um, so it's not, it doesn't actually undergo too much, uh, it actually undergoes very little oxidation, but that color is coming from the skins because the, the wine itself um, sits on the skins for, you know, a, a decent amount of time, nothing too extreme. And the reason for that is, is basically aromatics and texture. So Oscar, Oscar and Ava believe that, you know, a little bit of skin maceration, it really makes the aromatics pop on the wine and it adds really nice mouthfeel. Now Rioja, obviously famous worldwide for the red wine, but just like Bordeaux makes a white, that's kind of the secret white wine of mm -hmm. Bordeaux. Uh, Rioja makes this beautiful white wine and look at this beautiful place. It's, uh, you know, all of Spain is just this abundance of resources and land and and uh, probably uh, too few people to drink all the great wine that they make in Spain. So they really depend on the export market 
And uh, this wine just delivers an incredible value proposition. Uh, try to make a wine with this type of innate quality and detail and concentration and flavor profile anywhere else in the world and you're looking at a much more expensive bottle of wine. Um, so this is just really a top pick for me. I love, love, love doing this with great food. Obviously there's some amazing Spanish tapa restaurants, which is too few restaurants to pour this wine. If I had a great restaurant, I'd be pouring something like this by the glass just to freak people out and explore because I think this one appeals to such a big audience. This is our couple uh, here, Ava and Oscar. Ava and Oscar, and she's technically the winemaker? Yeah, so Ava actually comes from a long, long lineage of uh, growers in the region itself. Her family has been farming in the region for quite some time, which is advantageous to both of them when they started this label, um, because they have uh, vineyard, they have sources that pretty much are, you know, few and far between, and uh, very old vines, uh, bush trained, um, farmed correctly, uh, so it's... Um, they've been able to come out of the gates with some amazing, amazing raw material. Yeah, it's nice to have a great vineyard to work with. And um, they're obviously coming about it with some unique ideas, very artisan, I think. Yes, absolutely. Their, their biggest thing about, like, they're not trying to kind of fit into the, the box of Rioja, the traditional Rioja. They're, like, Oscar is actually an expert in, in Rioja history. And Oscar and Ava, they, the approach of this was to kind of challenge everything that's that's known and, and say why, you know, why why are we doing it that way? You know, what 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 does a crianza mean? What does a reserva mean? Why not move in the other direction and go towards typicity and place? And so they're very much spirit one of the one of the growers spearheading the vineyard, uh, the like kind of terrorist um, movement in Rioja right now, because um, their approach to things is very much pre phylloxera Rioja. So smaller sites, um, very much site specific itself, um, really important farming and doing it themselves rather than the bigger houses, which they look for more of a style, a house style. And um, they they usually, you know, purchasing fruit and not much um, involvement in the farming uh, itself. Cool. Well, this is one of the few brands that I have on our website in uh, more than one facing. I have both the red and the white, um, and I can't recommend them higher. So if you like this white wine, I want you to check out the red as well, because this is a brand to know about. This is a brand to follow. Um, definitely an artisan approach, small producer, right, John? Yeah, I mean, the, the white wine that we're talking about right now, Ian, I mean, they only make, for the entire world, let's just make sure here, is only, they only make 350 cases of this wine. Yeah, wow. So it's very hands-on, small, small family operation with uh, the highest uh, intentions, and uh, she just makes some lovely things happen. I think you'll find the red wine just beautiful, and this, this white wine's just got so much style and personality. And uh, you know, you, John, what, 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 when you smell and taste this wine, what, what foods do you think of? Well, this wine has a lot of texture, but with that texture, you know, comes, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, acidity and energy to it. Um, but I mean, it's kind of like the one plus one equals three. I mean, seafood would be great with this wine, something with like, you know, a richer sauce to kind of make that, the, you know, the texture on the wine as well as the texture in the food really pop. Um, and some, you know, saltier stuff. You had mentioned tapas earlier, Ian, and that, that totally makes sense as well. You know, something salty, um, you know, white, you know, white meats too, like mm -hmm. you know, chicken, rabbit, game, like that, that kind of stuff. I mean, that, that all of this makes total sense with this wine. And it's also just great to sip beforehand, right? Because an aperitif. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for bringing this wine to us. Uh, I'm a big fan and it'll live on our website long and strong. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Ian. I appreciate the time. Take care, buddy. All right. Good stuff, Keith. That, that guy's sharp. I really appreciate him. He's always um, awesome with us and he, he works for Rare Wine Company, the importer that you represent there. And uh, they, they have some just tremendous brands in their house. And the cool thing about that, Ian, is that they're it's a small book but everything is just very traditional it, you know it, it, it's it's not um what, what's out of the moment now they're very traditional producers so small producers and traditional so 
It's showing great too. So tasty. I know you got the samples. What do you think of the wine so far there, Keith? I have no words. They're so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Awesome stuff. I can do the speaking. I'm tired of the words. <laughs> That's right. Well, um, we do have to lean into you one more time because uh, we found another wine that you also represent from Vouvray. And so we'll move right into uh, our sixth wine after checking in with the audience for a second and just seeing how everyone's doing. Any questions you guys might have, any comments about any of the wines. Um, I'd love to find out if all those books are real, Valerie. Uh, how are you doing, Crystal? Hey, Come again. <laughs> I'm having a great time, really good. Awesome. The Kamali group is back there tasting the wines. I, they, they bought a couple other wines uh, from us as well, like other vintages and stuff from the same producers. So they're comparing. Um, Wendy and Jess, you're on the same screen for the first time. Good to see you both now on the same screen. Hi. Hi. We're, we're fully vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Disclaimer. Oh, cheers. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so any, anyone have any questions or comments? Miranda, how's it going with you guys? Great, it's a wonderful Saturday and enjoying all the wines. Lisa Test, how are things going for you? Lovely, these are actually quite lovely. Yeah, are you up at mom's house? No, I'm not. Oh, you I don't recognize the, the view that you've you picked a new Zoom location. I did have to change it up every once in a while. But it's <laughs> my it's the Italy and European background. I see. <laughs> Multinational room. Got it. Renee, thank you for joining us. Where are you zooming in from? Uh, my dining room in Tarzana, California. All right. <laughs> Well, did we get the wine? Are you okay? Are you tasting? Yeah. Yes, it's fabulous to be here. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll go into our sixth wine, which is in Vouvray, and we'll go straight into a, in a, a discussion with Jean Marc, the importer. Made that Porter mistake on before. Zoom with us right now, Jean Marc Descaven. Uh, hello, sir. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we love our Vouvray. We, uh, we're proud to have this um, in our Merchant of Wine store, and we selected it to be one of the uh, stars of white wine. Tell us a little bit about Vouvray. Well, Vouvray, the region, thanks for bringing up the map. Um, it's actually right in the middle of the Loire Valley, uh, next to the city of Tours. Tours is the main city in the Loire Valley. And um, uh, Vouvray is uh, the name also of the town. Uh, it's not only the appellation, but it's also a town, a pretty small town. Um, that's, like I said, uh, located right next to Tours, about 10 kilometers from Tours. Um, very, very famous uh, region, the Loire Valley. There's a bunch of castles. If a lot of you have traveled there, you know where, which one I'm talking about, the Chateau de Chenonceau, the Chateau of Wales. Uh, it's part of the big history in France. The king used to live in that area back in the 16th century, before they uh, moved to uh, Versailles in Paris. Um, and Vouvray, uh, the appellation, it's a pretty big appellation. It's about 2,000 hectares total, uh, which uh, translates to 5,000 acres, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what, what's really interesting about this area, uh, Vouvray, is uh, they only make and produce one grape, which is Chenin Blanc. That's really uh, their only focus. If you look at the other appellation within the Loire Valley next to Vouvray, you have Sancerre on the east that focuses more on the uh, Sauvignon Blanc. And then on the west, you have all these nice villages that I personally love, uh, famous for Cabernet Franc, like Saumur, uh, Chinon, Bourgueil, Saint Nicolas Bourgueil. And if you go more uh, on the west side, very close to the Atlantic Ocean, uh, you have Muscadet. So very, very uh, diverse region um, that I love personally. And uh, uh, Vouvray, like I said earlier, it's focused on Chenin Blanc. So they make uh, steel wine and sparkling wine in Vouvray. Um, when it comes to steel, they make sec. 
which is dry, demi-sec, and wallow, which is sweet. So it goes from dry to sweet. Uh, same goes with uh, the pétillant, the sparkling wine, the next sec and the sec sparkling wine. So very, very interesting reason. Uh, so we're going to focus on uh, my producer, which is uh, Domaine Boutet Saulnier, and we can see Christophe, uh, owner and winemaker, Christophe Boutet. Um, he took over his dad uh, back in 1997. So he's the third generation. His dad, Andre, uh, founded the winery in 1955. Um, back then, they had only five hectares, and today Christophe runs uh, 12 hectares, um, which is about 30 hectares. Um, so he married somebody, uh, his grandfather married somebody called Saulnier, which is why you have the two names, Boutet and Saulnier, together. Uh, so like I said, Christophe, third generation, he, um, he is organic since 2014, so it takes about five, six years to get the certification. So it's going to become uh, fully certified in 2022. Um, so they have vineyards in Vouvray and in the village next door, which is called Mont Louis sur Um He has famous neighbors in Vouvray, where this uh, Chenin Blanc we're going to taste today comes from. Oh so my God. Montpire, which is one of the most famous in Vouvray, and his price, as you know, Ian uh, is about five times uh, our price right now. Yeah, uh, we, we carry the Huey wines on our website too, and you can do a little price comparison. Yep. Uh, this is an incredible value and right. a really, really good quality and why we picked it because it's hard to get a Vouvray of this quality at this price. Yeah, I agree. And uh, so what uh, it's famous for is, uh, is, uh, is uh, sex, uh, and not sex, the one we take in today. We also make all the other uh, types of uh, Vouvray wines and sex moelleux. Uh, sparkling sec and sparkling uh, bunny sec. Uh, as far as this one, the Chenin Blanc sec, we next about a thousand cases a year, depending on the vintage. Uh, so about ten thousand bottles uh, altogether. The soil, as you can see here on the on the vineyard, the soil is uh, uh, clay and limestone. Those uh, big and strong horses. Um, Percheron horses, right? Is that what right. they're Percherons? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. These things are just like moving tanks. They're pulling a, a <clears throat> like a knife through the vineyard to increase the, the amount of nutrient that goes in the soil. Yep. And uh, they say that uh, um, uh, something like this, a plowing is better than watering the vineyard. True, and uh, yeah, those horses are really, really strong. Um, so everything is done by hand. The harvest is done by hand and then it's brought into the winery, uh, usually in October for the sec. Um, winery, they have a very, very nice underground cellar that's from the 19th century uh, that was made by uh, Vigneron back in the days just for, uh, um, you know, cellaring uh, the wine. You can see a, a small pit there. Um, so let's taste the wine. This is the... Uh, yes. Okay, 2009. 2019, I'm sorry. And, um, Really nice. What's uh, famous about Vouvray Sec is the minerality of the wine, which is what I love. Um, it's very, very easy to pair food with this kind of wine. I, I go personally for either sushi or spicy food, Thai food, um, and then any kind of seafood, uh, whether it's in sauce or not. It's very, um, very, very nice. Uh, usually, I mean, this wine is very, very uh, white flowers oriented as far as the, uh, the nose, lemongrass. A lot of citrus, and then uh, goes again the minerals when you touch in the palate, beautiful minerals. Very nice ripe fruit, acacia, honey, honey, uh -huh. beautiful wine. Um, it's about 2.5 grams of sugar, even though it's a sec. It has a little bit of residual sugar, which is very, very nice to uh, pair with the food. Um, edge in stainless steel, so no oak, okay, to keep the minerality of the wine very, very intense and the, the acidity as well. Um, yeah, so pneumatic press, everything is done by hand, like I said earlier. Very, very small um, um, touch by the, the winemaker. It's, it's um, beautiful wine. And again, like you said, Ian, very, very uh, inexpensive for what it is, in my opinion. A very good value from the, from the Vouvray area. 
And uh, a couple of other good reasons to have a bottle of Vouvray in your refrigerator. A, like you said, the food pairing options are pretty endless. Um, I love this wine with goat cheese mm -hmm. and uh, uh, stuff a chicken breast with goat cheese and have it with this, uh, with this wine. Um, I love this wine with uh, exotic barbecue. I love it with uh, uh, barbecue chicken pizza. I love it with uh, um, certainly the seafood and it's anything with a little heat, like you said, Thai food and, mm -hmm. and Chinese food. Um, but once you open this bottle, <clears throat> um, it's, it's a wine that uh, actually has a strength, a, a bulletproof, if you will, in, in the refrigerator. You could go two, three, four days with this wine. It's, it has that kind of richness that will protect itself. And um, so it's a, it's, you can really extend the life of your bottle of Vouvray over a few days. Just put it, keep it in the refrigerator once you open it. Uh, I use Corvin and uh, I'll be tasting tonight from a bottle that I Corvined over a month ago. And it's, at, it's still spectacular. I've probably pulled a glass three different times from the same bottle. Yeah. And um, I just can't recommend Coravin enough. Yeah, well, it's funny you said that because this bottle was opened on Saturday because I had sushi that night. <laughs> I had a glass with it and it tasted perfect. And yeah. three, days later, three days later, it's still really nice. Just keep it in the fridge and uh, yeah. that was a job. Well, thank you so much for that uh, beautiful uh, re re uh, reenactment of the Vouvray. Uh, we appreciate your time, sir. You have a good night and we'll talk to you soon. I know you've got some other things to present to us, so we can't wait to do some more business with you guys. Absolutely. Thank you, Ian. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Yeah. Cool. All those videos um, with the producers now live on the website. Um, if I, you wanted to uh, share those with other people. Um, again, we do have special pricing on all of the wines that are being featured tonight. Uh, and we'd love to get those out to you. Um, take advantage of, uh, if you want to buy five bottles or six bottles, sorry, there's a 5% discount on six bottles and there's a 10% discount automatically on, t on uh, 12. Um, to get the five bottle or the 5% discount, you need the Sixer code, six bottles, Sixer, uh, S-I-X-E-R at checkout, and that'll save you 5%. But 10% happens automatically when you get to 12. Um, I'm here to answer any questions you might have about any of the wines that we tasted tonight. I think they were uh, spot on what we, we were hoping for. And, uh, you know, we started off with um, a really cool but pretty... Um, and lower in alcohol wine from Portugal uh, coming in. I think that alcohol was around 13%, um, but it has like a freshness and, and minerality. It's very light and daft. We moved into uh, a little more complicated and serious uh, Chablis. Um, there are different, different levels of quality in Chablis, and I would put that Chablis up against any regular Chablis. I think it's just as good as they could get. And I uh, really love the quality there. I think you can smell that in the nose immediately. It has great impact and really, really a, a strong offering. Um, Chablis can range in price, and that really comes down to where the fruit comes down uh, comes from, because each of the, the better vineyards, the Premier Cruz and the Grand Cruz, which this wine is a lot in, involved in those uh, vineyards, those cost more. And so to use that fruit impacts your price. And so they've got a little bit of that going on in, in that uh, declassified Chablis, but uh, a really, really good offering. We move up uh, into the uh, Zin Humbrek up in Alsace. Oh, nope, from there we move over to uh, the West Coast. Uh, and we, we had uh, Chenin Blanc from Santa Barbara and a uh, 35 year old vineyard uh, really, really cool um, site, um, and I, I love the, the Fox and Brand and being able to um, taste that with Dick and Jenny tonight was really cool, uh, and I can't wait to go up and see them up in Santa Barbara. Um, but this this wine will uh, all these wines will be on my website for a very long time, 
but the pricing tonight is extra special, okay? Um, and then we moved over into Alsace with uh, Mr. Humbrex wine, a serious wine of, of a distinction, uh, unique and uh, great value. Uh, we finish up in uh, Rioja and in Vouvray with two really flashy wines. They've got great concentration and really wonderful style. Melvin J, did you have a favorite tonight? Yes. I, I enjoyed it. I took a, took a night off from doing taxes. I'm a CPA. But, <laughs> and, and, and believe me, I needed it. But no, I love the wines. The only comment that I, I um, would have is that uh, we, we, we love Foxen and we've been out there. The only thing when one's driving out to Foxen, you go when you go and then you think there can't be anything any further, keep going. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> love their place, but boy, is it far out. <laughs> you get committed. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, that's awesome. I'm glad you were able to to, to experience that with them and uh, be able to share all those wines. I know that the tax deadline's coming up. Is it Monday? It is. It is, and in 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 this is um, this is the frantic period. I fortunately, I'm I'm senior enough. I just kind of sit back and say, "You guys got to finish that stuff." <laughs> but, uh, that's that's one advantage of having been a CPA for 45 years. But uh, it, it, yeah, it, it, but uh, yeah, it, it gets and, and you do get some very weird phone calls at this point. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do. Well. But no, great fun, and uh, I definitely uh, uh, the Zin Humbrek was very unique, and I'm I'm I will be on the site uh, very shortly. <laughs> wow! Does anybody else have a favorite they want to mention? Number six. Number six. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm gonna buy a case. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, have you noticed, Ian, that the wines get better? You know, after you taste five wines, they, everything starts tasting better. Yeah, well, we, we get better. That's my always my uh, <laughs> yes. Thomas, I think at you know the first sip, we just we needed that oh, first wow. sip, and then we all start to relax a little bit, and everything starts tasting better and better and better. Ian. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question. You know me; I'm always having questions. All right. So hit me. The, the the Zen Humbrick wine. Um, so did I understand it right that they can't make a hundred percent Chardonnay? Is that why they had to mix it? Um, I didn't get that. You, okay. that might have been something they said. I, 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 I but, uh, Chardonnay is not a, um, typical grape variety of Alsace. So that's why they have to play around and they use the Z instead of the, le the number two on the label, okay. which I think is a brilliant way to work around it. But they have to um, go they, when they put the the uh, title of the wine on the bottle and they pay the taxes. They're they're actually um, listing it as a Vanda Table, which is um, in the hierarchy of things. It doesn't even have to be from Alsace. But this is single vineyard Alsatian Axelwa Chardonnay blend, and that's that's a, a really cool little find and something that. You know, a lot of people will probably look at this on the shelf and not and just walk right by it, um, unless you tasted it, unless you knew a little bit about it. And um, I, I just adore that wine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I really, I really like that one, and I also enjoyed the Vouvray as well. So thanks. Yeah, you know, and I think a little sweetness isn't a bad thing. In there's a time and a moment for, for the for just that little bit of kiss of residual. Right. Um, and then if you know the food is right the drier uh, style works out beautifully and um, uh, what I love about the the you know the Chablis and our wine from Portugal is that there's just a different moment for everything um, the Shannon the um, I think I got them all in there and, and don't forget about that Rioja Blanco that thing is such a beautiful, fun, unique wine. Um, really, really um, a treasure. So we really went all over the place um, and it was it was fun to put this together. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, we've got uh, Stars of Rosé coming up 
um, and with some really, really special rosé producers showing off their stuff and some legends on that as well. And then we go over uh, to our Stars of Pino in, uh, in July. Um, and we are, we've planned a year-long calendar. We'll do South Africa in August. We'll have, we'll, we're gonna do a little fun competitive thing. We'll see how the Aussies and the New Zealanders uh, go because we're gonna make it Australia versus New Zealand on the same Zoom. So uh, we, could, we can expect some shenanigans. Um, but uh, and the, with the time uh, change, I think we can get them live on the Zoom which will be cool. Uh, so we, we want to thank all the producers for being here and helping me corral these guys, whether they're in France or Spain or San Francisco, or wherever they were, to be able to pull all these uh, things together. I apologize for my lack of smoothness tonight on the uh, PowerPoint, but I did my best with uh, uh, ma managing the horizontal and the vertical. Um, but the, uh, the real fact is I get to see your face and be able to have fun with you guys tonight. And it's really special to be able to do this. And it's always a good time when we have great wine involved. So um, the audience is special. You guys are great. Thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the added savings. There is an email in your email box at this time. It came in at 8 o'clock um, showing you the pricing. Uh, and that pricing again is good until tomorrow night. So uh, have at it and I hope to see you all very soon and enjoy your weekend.